In this video, you'll learn everything you need to know about aortic stenosis, including hearing a number of murmurs recorded from real patients. Let's get into it. The aortic valve separates the left ventricular outflow trap from the aortic root. Its purpose is to allow the flow of blood into the aorta in systole when the LV is contracting and to prevent backflow in diastole when the LV is relaxing. The normal aortic valve has three leaflets, the left and right coronary cusp, which correspond to the location of the origin of the left and right coronary arteries, as well as a third non-coronary cusp. Aortic stenosis describes a thickening and calcification of the aortic valve leaflets in a way that restricts their opening in systole, which has the effect of reducing the size of the valve orifice. This obstructs the flow of blood leaving the LV. Aortic stenosis is one of the commonest valve lesions. It affects up to 10% of the population above 80 years of age in the USA and Europe, and it's frequently encountered in both clinical practice and in exams at all levels for students and medical professionals. Let's start by looking at the causes of aortic stenosis. The most common cause by far is senile degeneration of the aortic valve. The underlying pathophysiology is complex, but involves endothelial dysfunction due to mechanical stress and lipid deposition. This can trigger an inflammatory response involving immune cell infiltration into the valve and subsequent thickening and calcification. It usually affects those over the age of 65. Risk factors are similar to conventional cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension and hyperlipidemia, as well as chronic kidney disease. It is sometimes preceded by aortic sclerosis, which is a descriptive term for thickening of the valve without obstruction to flow. This will be covered in another video. The second most common cause is due to the premature degeneration of a bicuspid aortic valve. Around 1% of the population are born with such a valve that either has two leaflets or one where two of the three leaflets are fused together, a so-called functionally bicuspid valve. These usually function well and are asymptomatic until middle age when they frequently degenerate and cause aortic valve disease. Other causes of aortic stenosis are rarer and include congenital aortic stenosis, where the valve is stenosed from birth, and rheumatic heart disease, which is now very rare in the Western world. Let's move on to the symptoms patients with aortic stenosis present with. As with most valve disease, aortic stenosis is usually asymptomatic until it's severe in nature. At this point, it can cause three main symptoms. Syncope or presyncope on exertion due to an inability of the heart to sufficiently increase cardiac output in a vasodilated state. Exertional anginal chest pain due to increased myocardial oxygen demand and shortness of breath due to both LV pressure overload and heart failure. The triad of symptomatic aortic stenosis can therefore be remembered by the mnemonic SAD, syncope, angina, dyspnea. Any of these symptoms in a patient with known or suspected aortic stenosis should prompt urgent referral for assessment and intervention. What about the signs you may elicit when examining a patient with aortic stenosis? First of all, when taking the patient's blood pressure, you may notice that they have a narrow pulse pressure. This is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures. This occurs because the upstroke in pressure in systole is less pronounced in aortic stenosis. For the same reason, palpation of a central pulse may reveal a slow rising pulse. An arterial transducer would also reveal this to be anacrotic, that is, with an attenuated dicrotic notch, which is produced by the closure of the aortic valve. Palpation of the chest may reveal a heaving apex beat. Instead of a discrete impulse, the apex beat can be felt as a sustained, forceful pulsation on the chest wall. It usually indicates underlying LV hypertrophy, which is a complication of aortic stenosis. This happens because, over time, the myocardium thickens in order to produce a greater force of contraction in systole to overcome the increased afterload in aortic stenosis. Now let's consider the heart sounds produced when auscultating the chest of a patient with aortic stenosis. As a reminder, the first heart sound, S1, corresponds to the closure of the atrioventricular valves, and the second heart sound, S2, corresponds to the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves. Systole therefore occurs between S1 and S2. 
Blood flowing through the narrowed aortic valve accelerates and becomes turbulent, which creates a murmur. Aortic stenosis produces an ejection systolic murmur. It is said to have a crescendo-decrescendo whooshing pattern. This pattern can be explained by the changes in pressure in the LV and aorta. The speed of ejected blood, and hence loudness of the murmur, is determined by the difference in pressure between the LV and aorta. In a normal heart, there is almost no difference in pressure between these two when the aortic valve is open, so no murmur is perceived. In aortic stenosis, however, the restriction to flow means that in systole, the pressure in the LV exceeds that in the aorta and hence creates a pressure drop or gradient. This pressure gradient rises until mid-systole, where the speed of ejected blood and hence loudness of the murmur are greatest, before falling off back towards zero when the aortic valve closes. Because the systolic pressure in the aorta is relatively high at around 120 mm mercury, the magnitude of the gradient in mid-systole is much greater than that in early or late systole. By contrast, in pansystolic murmurs, such as mitral regurgitation, the difference in pressure gradients between the LV and LA when blood is ejected backwards through the mitral valve is very similar, hence creating a murmur of the same intensity throughout systole. Let's have a listen to the heart sounds produced by aortic stenosis. Make sure to use headphones for the best audio experience. The murmur in aortic stenosis is classically loudest in the aortic area, located at the right upper sternal border of the chest, although it is often heard across the precordium as well. It usually radiates to the carotid arteries. Notice the whooshing crescendo decrescendo pattern. Let's have a listen to another. In this patient, also notice that the second heart sound is very quiet. A quiet second heart sound is one of the most reliable signs that indicates severe aortic stenosis and occurs because the valve is so calcified and stenosed that it barely opens enough to cause a forceful sound when it closes. Next, in this patient, it's interesting that we can hear a fourth heart sound in the apical area. This sound occurs just before S1 and is due to atrial contraction against a stiff and hypertrophied LV although a fourth heart sound does not specifically suggest severe aortic stenosis. For example, the LV hypertrophy may be due to hypertension. Sometimes, a pansystolic murmur can also be heard in the apical area in patients with aortic stenosis. This is called a Galavardin phenomenon, and is due to a separation of the components of the murmur into a harsh, loud component at the right upper sternal border, and a quieter, high-frequency musical component at the apex. This latter is thought to be due to vibration of aortic cusps rather than turbulent blood flow moving upwards in the aorta. This sound can be confused with that of mitral regurgitation, but in contrast, it does not radiate to the axilla. What investigations are needed to confirm a diagnosis of aortic stenosis? Although there are features on the electrocardiogram and chest x-ray, these are not specific for aortic stenosis and are only suggestive. As with all valve lesions, echocardiography is the definitive investigation to both confirm the diagnosis and assess severity. First, let's have a look at what you might see on the 12 lead ECG. This ECG is recorded from a patient with aortic stenosis. It shows relatively tall QRS complexes with lateral ST depression and T-wave inversion, suggesting LV hypertrophy and strain. This next ECG shows LV hypertrophy and left bundle branch block, as well as atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular response in a patient with severe aortic stenosis. Now let's look at a chest x-ray of a patient with aortic stenosis. 
Although many patients will have a normal chest X-ray, this patient has visible calcification of the aortic knuckle, which is associated with calcification and stenosis of the aortic valve. Now let's have a look at the echo findings and aortic stenosis. On the left, this parasternal long axis view of a normal heart shows the aortic valve to be thin and highly mobile. It opens fully with normal leaflet excursion in systole. In contrast, on the right, the aortic valve can be seen to be thickened, calcified and has significantly reduced mobility, with only minimal excursion in systole. The orifice is very small, which restricts the flow of blood leaving the LV. We can use the echocardiogram to grade the severity of aortic stenosis, which, as we'll see, is essential in determining appropriate management. This diagram is a representation of the LV outflow tract and the aortic valve. The hemodynamics of aortic stenosis can be explained by the continuity equation. Since flow must be conserved in a closed system, Blood moving from a larger space to a smaller one must accelerate, like a river speeding up through a restriction. Using Doppler, we can measure the peak velocity of blood moving through the aortic valve on echocardiography. One criteria for severe AS is a peak velocity of greater than 4 meters per second. Next, since the LV is contracting against a restriction, the pressure before the aortic valve will be higher than after it, creating the so-called pressure gradient. A mean gradient of greater than 40 mm of mercury is considered severe aortic stenosis. Finally, we can use these measurements to calculate the aortic valve orifice area. Directly measuring the area on echocardiography would be very inaccurate, so this is usually calculated from other measurements instead. A valve area of less than 1 cm squared would be indicative of severe aortic stenosis. These are the three key values, although there are other measurements that are routinely performed. In the final section, we're going to cover the management of aortic stenosis. I base these on major international guidelines, namely valvular heart disease guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology in 2021 and the American College of Cardiology slash American Heart Association in 2020. The management of aortic stenosis depends on its severity. Mild aortic stenosis requires no specific action and is either not followed up or followed up infrequently in younger patients. Moderate aortic stenosis is followed up on a regular basis with repeat echocardiograms on a one to three yearly basis, usually closer to a yearly basis for those approaching severe criteria. If a patient is diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis, the first step is a careful evaluation of symptoms. If the patient does have symptoms, valve intervention is recommended. If they do not, the decision depends on other criteria, such as whether there is an impaired LV systolic function, raised brain-derived natriuretic peptide levels, or a positive exercise test, which means the development of symptoms or a drop in blood pressure when the patient is exercised on a treadmill in a controlled setting, as these indicate that the heart is starting to decompensate. If any of these are present, valve intervention is recommended, and if not, regular and careful follow-up, at least six monthly, with repeat echocardiography and clinical assessment is required. Patients in this cohort need to be aware of what symptoms to look out for, as untreated severe symptomatic aortic stenosis has a dismal prognosis, with around a 50% mortality at two years. So what types of valve intervention are available? Broadly, there are two types, TAVI, or transcatheter aortic valve implantation, or surgical aortic valve replacement. TAVI is performed in the catheter laboratory by a cardiologist specialising in structural intervention. The circulation is accessed percutaneously via a major artery, usually the femoral artery, and a valve on a deflated balloon is passed under X-ray guidance to the aortic root. The balloon and valve are then expanded in place, crushing the native stenose valve to the side. The procedure is relatively quick, taking as little as one hour and can be performed under local anaesthetic. It can only be used to deliver biprosthetic valves. It results in a short hospital stay, often as little as three days, although the long-term durability of TAVI valves is uncertain. So what about surgical aortic valve replacements? They are performed by a cardiothoracic surgeon via open surgery. 
The procedure is usually performed via a midline stenotomy. It is done under general anaesthesia and requires the patient to be on cardiopulmonary bypass, where the heart is stopped and a machine takes over the circulation for a period of time. Either mechanical or bioprosthetic valves can be inserted via the surgical approach. Patients usually stay in hospital around a week if there are no complications. It is more established technique and there are good data for long-term results, especially for mechanical valve replacements. So which of the two techniques is better? This question has been extensively investigated by a number of trials over recent years. In October 2023, the five-year outcomes of the PARTNER-3 trial were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This trial compared low-risk patients needing aortic valve intervention. The primary outcome was a composite of death, stroke or readmission to hospital. Overall, TAVI and surgical aortic valve replacement performed similarly with a hazard ratio of 0.79 in favour of TAVI, but this was not statistically significant. So how is the decision made clinically? European and American guidelines do vary slightly, but the general themes are that surgical aortic valve replacements are performed for younger patients at a lower surgical risk, especially if there's a desire for a mechanical valve replacement or a need for other cardiac surgery, such as coronary bypass surgery. By contrast, TAVIs are preferred for older patients or those at higher surgical risk where a mechanical valve is not desired. All borderline patients should be discussed in a multidisciplinary team between cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons. And that was the Murmur Master Summary on Aortic Stenosis. If you found this video useful, be sure to check out the Murmur Master app, which contains hundreds of heart sounds recorded from real patients. It's also got great summaries on a huge number of valve lesions, so you can quickly get to grips with key bits of information, from presentation to management. You can also test your skills with hundreds of quiz and test questions. It's updated regularly as per international guidelines and is used currently by medical professionals all across the world. Also, remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one. See you next time.